here with Matt Swope, uh, recruiting coordinator at University of Maryland, 10th season. Uh, also played for the Terrapins, but drafted by the Expos, uh, played in the Expos organization. So, Matty, thanks for jumping on with me. Appreciate you guys having me. Thank you. Um, what's your time in Clinton, Iowa, and, and Vermont with the Expos teach you? Oh, man. <laughs> I didn't know you are going to start off hot like this. So it's funny because I actually went up to Vermont and uh, I drove my stuff after I was drafted and I literally was there for one week and then I was gone. So <laughs> I went to Clinton, Iowa after that and I slept on a couch the rest of the season. So in Clinton, Iowa, I think there was do two dog food making factories at the time. Uh, there was a Walmart we went to shoot hoops in and got kicked out often. We bought our TVs there and they had like a 90 day return policy. So on the 89th day, we returned that. So, uh, and the two inches of water in the shower was also interesting. So I'm sure it's come a long way since then, but my experience was uh, rather interesting in the Midwest league for sure. Well, that Clinton doesn't even have a team anymore. They have a prospect league team. Now they're a college summer league team. Now I can tell you that their logo though. I did enjoy the logo. Yeah. Who were who were your managers at that point? Do you remember your managers, your coordinators at all at that point? Yeah, I had Dave McAmara, who was a longtime Double A guy. You know, been with the Orioles. Um, he was he was a lifer. And then throughout my time in the Expos, I was actually exposed to a lot of different guys: uh, Joey Cora, Rock Reigns, um, guys like that that were that were big leaguers that you could just kind of watch him and 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 learn the in and out. So the unfortunate part about that time with the Expos was it was we didn't know if we were getting contracted at the time uh had a different scouting director each year it, it was just kind of in flux so when it kind of happened it was you know a little bit disappointing just because you you had no idea um from year to year or even month to month what was kind of happening but um that time for sure shaped who I was and and you know I'm, I'm sure you're gonna ask it but that that's kind of where I started my rabbit hole with hitting was you know, you had a roving guy, you had a hitting coach, you had a coordinator, you had all these things. And it was the first time in my life where I was exposed to all those different things, but at the same time where I was overwhelmed. And I think a lot of guys currently in professional baseball that seek out private coaches, uh, whether it's in college or high school, is there's there's just so much back and forth and, and there's more information than ever. Just so much stuff can get lost. So that's for me when I kind of started the hitting journey was was 20 years ago. Uh, and I'm just trying to, you know, help kids kind of navigate through that a little bit better today. Hey, with all those guys you're dealing with, did they all use the same terminology? No. I mean, <laughs> and that's the hard part. <laughs> I, I think organizations are doing a better job now of trying to make sure the verbiage is the same from the top to the bottom. But I think that's always been the disconnect at that level is you have so many voices and, and it may be the same information, but you're getting told different things. Um, talk about that a little bit and just the difference, because a lot of people don't understand that. Like, you're going to hear so many different voices. Yeah, communication is key. If you don't have communication, it doesn't matter. And, and regardless of the organization being in place or, or they may have good intentions, it doesn't always get trickled down like that. And so for me, it, it's all about the player. It's not about me. It's not about the vocabulary that I want to use. I actually give my kids brain tests. There's 16 types of brain, brain types. And I try to understand how they learn, what makes them tick, the type of communication they're going to adhere to. So it, it's, it's about the player. You have to go in so many different ways to try to find a way to communicate with them. Some guys, it's external cues. Sometimes it's internal. Sometimes it's just don't say anything at all. Sometimes it's the private talks. Uh, and I think the guys, you know, like Donnie Ecker with the Rangers, who was with the Giants, I got a good relationship with. And the guys that are really doing a great job at, at the pro level are master communicators. It's not even necessarily their geniuses with the swing path. It's, it's the communication part. So coaches get lost in the weeds, I think, with, with some things sometimes, but it's, it's always going to come down with how you can communicate with players. Hey, how are you, the 16 different cognitive pieces there, how are you figuring that out? Is that an inventory piece? Is that a computer piece? How are you evaluating your players with the yeah, cognitive yeah, piece? Yeah. yeah, there's a couple of different sports books out there. I forget the guy, Niedig, I, I'm going to butcher his name, but he's, he was the godfather of it all that started it. You know, a lot of different companies and sports teams have uh, employed him to do that. It, it's just a very basic test. I have them fill out and 
you can kind of tell if, if, if they're being honest or not, there's going to be some outliers, but it's just a baseline. You know, it'll give you something. It's like, Hey, this guy's a motivator. This guy's an artist. And, and right there, just most of the time, the characteristics are similar enough to where it's like, okay, I need to put my arm around this guy, or I, mean, I need to really be tough on this guy. Um, and, and it just gives you, like, like I said, a baseline to communicate. We're not even really talking about baseball. Hey, which area scout drafted you? Mike Toomey. Yep, I know Mike. Because yeah, I was Mike. coaching at JMU when you were playing at Maryland. So okay. um, yeah. there yeah, were Mike's- so many good scouts around yeah. that time on the East Coast and good players. I uh, was fortunate to be on the East Coast during that time with the amount of players and scouts we had there. Yeah, what's what's interesting about Mike Toomey is, you know, he obviously has been in the game a long time. He he does great work um, in different countries now. He's just a genuine guy. He's actually coaching at my alma mater, the, the Matha Catholic High School. So things have come full circle. So it's kind of cool to see that. Hey, what were the what were the biggest routines that helped you as a player? As a player, I think I, I really didn't have any. And that, that was part of, you know, it was 2000, you know, 2002 when I got drafted. I was one of those guys. Again, this is part of my journey. I was going into the cage hours and hours a day figuring it out. It was I had to feel it. I had to do the reps. And, and until I felt right, I didn't get out. And even though I was successful in college, that necessarily isn't the best way. And obviously with the Internet and the tools, we have so much more. But I was just one of those guys that's a grinder. Right now, you know, daily with my guys, I make my guys come in and meditate for three minutes every single day to start the session. It doesn't matter what they did on their test, what's going on with their girlfriend. It doesn't matter. I force them to meditate for three minutes every day and hold hands pre-COVID. Um, and it's something that's just like, hey, let's just let's just relax. Let's just get to this point and relax. And um, you know, those are things I kind of do with my guys. I, I, I don't force them into routines on, on game days. Um, but for me personally, the breath work app, I always start my morning with breath work. Uh, and then I do a headspace. So I really like headspace. The guided meditations are great for guys, for myself. And um, is that where you're using in the three minutes? Are you using, are you using guided meditation? Uh, I know everybody does a little bit. Different. Are you having them lay down for the, for the guided meditation? You have them seated. How are you having them attack the, yeah. the guided meditation? So, so pre-COVID, I wanted them to get uncomfortable. I made them hold hands. I wanted them to get comfortable being uncomfortable. You know how it is. And, you know, right now I, I, they, I let them lay down. I let them sit. Some of the guys sit up and, and with Indian style. So I kind of just let them do their thing right now. But yes, it's a guided meditation through Headspace. What I like about them, it changes every day. So if you just go on the daily meditation, it's always different and it has a different message. And I think that resonates with the guys. Yeah, that that article came out, I don't know, it was about 10 years ago. They tracked NBA teams and the amount of teams, the teams that won more touched each other more, um, whether it was a high five, butt slap, um, you know, so the human touch, I know it's been a crazy two and a half years yeah. trying to get through COVID, but the, the touch piece, and that's probably where we've lost a little bit in society right now, um, is just that touch piece because the, the human contact piece is important for uh, developing relationships developing communication, that touch piece is really important because the most successful teams do actually, they touch more. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And how did you handle the failure part then as a player? Not well. I, this is really embarrassing to say, but I remember one time I was in Clinton and I called my mom and I was actually in tears uh, just because I never failed. I had a really good college career. I always hit and I was being pulled so many different ways, I was lost. And I never felt lost in 22 years of my life at any point. So I handled it very poorly then. Uh, And so I didn't have a mechanism. I I didn't have anything. I didn't have these conversations in college. So, you know, as I've gone through my life, I've gone through some really bad things personally with with family, losing uh, siblings. Uh, That was really my wake up call for me to kind of do things differently and realize, Hey, there's different avenues. And this is a real thing. I mean, back at, back at 22 when I was in pro ball before I actually failed, I, I had, I didn't, I, re, I don't even know if I knew what the word anxiety was or depression. I, I really didn't. So it's something that's definitely as time gone on, I've been a little bit more sensitive to, and, um, you know, try to open my eyes to that with players. Is that what you would have hoped more as a player? that you would have had? I mean, what would you, what are you using now that you didn't have as a player with your players? Oh my gosh. I, I think there's almost too many resources. 
uh, oh, there's never too many. I, I just think it's the same thing with hitting. There, there's, you could be pulled in so many different directions. But what's really great about Maryland and being at a bigger school, we have two full-time sports psychs now that are on staff that the guys can go to quietly. I don't know if they go. Um, they can share it with me if they want. So having those resources where kids don't feel scared necessarily to go reach out and get help is, is a huge thing because, listen, man, we, we, it's the same thing with recruiting. I'm trying to figure out what 24s and 25s are going to be interested in in four years. Uh, these kids have been on the phone and they're stimulated uh, like me and you never were. So I think just the general resources with that online stuff, the, the meditation apps, uh, different types of things like that. We've done a better job as a society uh, accepting that instead of being so hard, kind of like what it was when me and you grew up, where it was just like, hey, just tough it out. You'll be fine. Uh, no emotion, this, that, and the other thing. So I think the resources today are, are, are just way better, but I'm thankful, Maryland, that it's not the coaches that have to yeah. coach, be hard on a kid, also talk about the mental aspect. We do that in nature, right? We do that in our conversations, but having the outside resources are definitely a game changer for kids. Well, and we've talked about this on the podcast quite a bit. They need to have someone else outside their coaching circle uh, because the they need someone that they can get vulnerable with. And not that they can't do that with their coaches, but it's still different when coaches are right in the lineup and, and those things. So they need to have an outside resource to go to to talk about things. And hopefully they can talk to their coaches about it. But there are going to be some things that they run into that they may not want to talk to coaches about that they need to talk to somebody else and a professional. Um, yeah, for sure. I, I, I try to dummy it down early. My, my brother died in high school, you know, a freak accident, got electrocuted. My sister died of cancer in her 30s. So I try to always, you know, start my conversations with kids and, and, and be vulnerable and level with them and saying, hey, you know, I've been through, you know, some some really tough things. And, and that helps a lot, you know, having been through those experiences and, and in a different way. And that allows them to at least my relationship with them start off on that. So um, that that's been big for me, able to connect with, you know, the pro guys, the, the, the high school guys, the college guys and even even staff and other coaches. And, and that's your motivation with the versus cancer stuff, correct? Sure. Obviously, your yeah. sisters, and because you've done a lot of work with them. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, at first I was doing all different types of stuff. I did the the Man of the Year Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Did tons with the LLS back in the uh, two thousand, you know, early, late two thousands, uh, uh, two thousand eight on to like two thousand thirteen, and then I was. I just had, had been exposed to a lot of children and there's, you have kids, I have kids. There's, there's nothing like seeing a kid that just hasn't had a chance to live his life yet. And it, it can rock everybody to the core. So, you know, we've, we've done a lot with the kids versus cancer. We try to get our kids exposed to that because what makes athletes good is they're go, 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 and they're one track minded, but there needs to be some humility in what we do, uh, especially now during this time. So, uh, yeah, we try to we try to get as much involved as we can with them. I've been an ambassador for with them for a couple of years. And Chase Jones, who started that, was out of North Carolina. So it's been a great relationship, and it's an honor to try to help them. It's tremendous to give back. What do you wish somebody would have told you before you got into coaching? Oh, man, just be yourself. Uh, that's, that's the hardest thing for me. Uh, you know, when I first... I was blessed. Thank God, you know, Coach Chef and Eric Backage kind of helped me get back into it when I was I was 32. I wasn't young like most coaches are. Um, was I think at the beginning you're, you're you're observing so many things and you have mentors and that's great, but you can't coach like the previous coach. You can't coach like the previous hitting coach. You can't be your head coach. So my advice to anybody out there that's that's starting young is just be authentic. It's it, you can take information from everybody. You should be a lifelong learner, but it has to come with, with a message of authenticity because the kids will see right through it if it's not. Did Coach Chef and Coach Backage help you with that to find your voice? Did they tell you that? Man, I, I can't tell you how thankful I am for Coach Chef. So I, I came back in 2012. I was, I was doing stuff with the military government contracting after I got done playing professional baseball. So I, I just was tired of it. I just wanted to get back in the game. I was itching. I would do anything. Um, so... Eric Backage, that was the year when I got back into it. He was going to go to Michigan, and I was, you know, having some. And, and I had started a good relationship with him years before that, so we we had become pretty close. And you know, he was going, and I had some talks about maybe trying to go with him. And then he was like, "Hey, you know, let me call Coach Chef." And 
coach Jeff, thank God, you know, met me and was just like, Hey, yeah, I'll give you a spot. And, and I can't tell you, he empowered me to do so many things uh, that so many head coaches would not at that time. And it allowed me to learn all the ins and outs, all the tough things, the fundraising, the budgets, all those different things immediately that, that most guys don't get exposed to for years and years. So I, I'm forever indebted to him. He knew the passion I had. He knew I was an alumni. Uh, he knew how much I cared about this place and how much I bled for Maryland. So uh, all credit goes to him for allowing me to do that because I would not be in the position I am with, without him uh, allowing me to do what I did at such, a, such an early time in my career. Hey, do you feel like being in the real world first has helped you now coming into the coaching side of things? Oh, for sure. You know, obviously going through all the failures in pro ball, you know, I got my arm reconstructed, my shoulder reconstructed twice by Dr. Andrews back to back spring trainings. So I dealt with that, uh, went back and played independent ball, had a great year, but I knew it was over. My sister got cancer, you know, that year, 25. So I was going through a lot of transition then. Um, but, but definitely it was something that during that time, you know, shaped me moving forward. Um, you know, for sure. And, and going into the real world, just realizing, I think with that, with a different job was like, this isn't my path. This isn't my, my calling. This isn't my path. I just can't do this. It doesn't matter how much money I make, how much the government pays. I can't do this. You know, I'm checking ESPN five times a day. I'm got, you know, Redskins or commanders season tickets. I'm looking forward to just Sundays and, you know, so I, I had to get back in, in sports and, and knew that's where my heart was. How much does it help uh, recruiting because you played at Maryland? Oh, it's 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 much easier because I've walked every step. I know I know what the campus tour is probably a little easier, right? The campus oh, tours. What, honestly, thank God, College Park is come, night and day. From it was stagnant for thirty years, and they've done a great job in the past five years. So. Uh, but yeah, well, just being able to walk the same steps of the field, uh, th there's not a day that goes by that honestly, I don't walk in a certain aspect of that campus and think about when I was 18 doing it the same. So that when you're having recruiting talks, you know, when you're doing Zooms, I, it's just, I tell people it's not really a job, it's a lifestyle. My parents got married on campus in the chapel. They both went to Maryland. So I've been coming to football games since I was three years old. So uh, one hundred percent. It's it's part of just who I am, and it, I got a lot of passion for sure. You think it's harder recruiting now post COVID, or is it easier because of the Zoom piece and maybe being able to connect face to face with recruits, even if they're not on campus? Uh, I'm gonna have an unpopular take that uh, I don't like how early it's gotten. I also don't necessarily like the rule changes. I I was a big proponent of the unofficial visits kids come to campus because we actually with our staff every single one of us sat down in rooms and took the time with kids so i think that's done a disservice for people that do put the necessary time into recruit so i think it's gotten easier for for some of the uh, the top programs because there, there isn't that piece uh, but the zoom has definitely helped when it comes to, to offers or presentations or stuff like that. But I definitely think we're, we're on a slippery slope and I need to be careful what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, and I can talk to it cause I did it forever too, but I still think that they need to allow official visits earlier. I think that that would clean a lot of things up and hopefully somebody from the NCAA is listening in. And, and I know we have to vote on that legislation and nobody's brought it. I just think, if you could open up official visits earlier, it allows kids to take their five, and it also allows kids to see who's actually interested rather than just an unofficial here and there. It um, puts more emphasis on who's actually interested in you or who's just dabbling, and you don't have to answer any of that. That's just me on my soapbox that I just think it would be easier if you could open up the official visits to maybe sophomore year. Yeah, and it's, it's just something that's – I don't think it's a positive trend for to have 13 and 14 year olds all committed. Yeah. I just don't. It's just well, the numbers of, of kids leaving show that it's it, the it's not trending in the right direction because the amount of kids that are leaving the schools that they're at, and that's for a variety of reasons. But I'm sure. I, well. How many how many officials did you take, or did you know you were going to Maryland? I know your parents went there. Did you know you were going to go to Maryland? I actually want to go to Clemson back then, so I give. Like I want to go to Stanford. <laughs> Okay, there you go. I, I actually went on a, a visit and I did the team one showcase. So anytime I saw Leggett after that, or when I talked to him, I actually texted with him a couple weeks ago, I crushed him on that. So I, you know, at that point, I, that was like the dream school. But, I, you know, obviously, I was super, super happy in Maryland. But I, 
I did the visits, but you know, back then it was, it was like your senior year. You didn't even know anything. Sure. So I'm not saying that we're going to be able to push it back, but the only official visits that are being used now are when they're committed and it's only yes. your committed guys. Yes. So what's, what's the point in it really? It's so um, there's advantages and disadvantages. I just hate to see 13 year olds make decisions right now when um, I think that's why I have a 19 year old and he still doesn't know what he wants. He's in college right now and he's having good experience, but he still doesn't know what he wants at 19. My 16 year old daughter has no idea what she's going to do. The best part about Maryland was your first two years, you didn't have to declare and it was letters and sciences. And I said, thank God. And that was 18 to 20. So I totally agree. All right, let's dive into the hitting part with your, let's, let's go with your new guys first. When you're, you're jumping in with your new players, where do you start with them? I think the most important part, and this is also something for a lot of younger coaches is you absolutely cannot just go in there and start fixing their swing. (laughs) So these kids have worked their entire lives. They've never failed. They've been successful. We have to be super careful for when we, we kind of infil, infiltrate what we want. So with our guys that come in, let's say they're freshmen or JUCO kids that I've never had, I'll spend the first maybe month and a half. I won't say a word to them. So I'll kind of just watch what they do, watch their mannerisms, watch how they're going about their business. Yes, I will put them in drills. We'll, we'll, we'll put them in some constraints. We'll, we'll, we'll put them on the spin ball machine and make them compete. But that's the point where I'm kind of learning about them. And a lot of times what you'll find is, is very rarely is a freshman just wearing it out and and not going through any adversity. So, you know, when I talked about the communication piece, you have to find ways for them to kind of come to you. So, you know, for the first month and a half, I just kind of watch. So, and and the things I do, I, I think too many coaches are, are trying to go strictly to the path and manipulate that first. And that is not the way that I coach. Uh, I'm big on the vision, the timing, uh, how we use the ground and movement stuff. So that for me is a little bit easier to coach throughout it without necessarily breaking a kid down and feeling like I'm, I'm attacking his swing. So I think it's important that we, we kind of watch first and, and, and kind of learn the kid and, and understand that he needs to go through some stuff because I've had players that have taken two years uh, to, to fully buy in. Yeah. And until a kid really fails uh, he's not necessarily going to say, Hey, what I did in high school or what I've done in the past isn't going to work. So it's, it's definitely a slippery slope. And for a coach, I've learned over the years that just because you know something, just because you can help them doesn't mean it's time and doesn't mean it's going to work. So that's been something I've learned through my career that is just trying to be a little bit more patient. You definitely have to pick your spots. Hey, do you have any of those conversations with your recruits? For sure. For sure. I think what we do a really good job with is, you know, setting the expectation early. You know, we're, we're giving homework assignments. We're, we're being we're being tough on them. And, and I'm going through some Zooms like this stuff with hitting. So my, what I'm trying to do is, is set the expectation and set the standard for kind of what we're looking for, what we're doing, the vocabulary, how they learn before they get here. So they feel confident that they can hit the ground running. And trust me, it's hard. I mean, there's, we don't have a director of ops right now. So we're all running around before a week before a game with, with, with our heads cut off. But at the same time, you have to put the time in with those recruits after they commit. And I think as college coaches, sometimes it's kind of tough because, okay, we got them and it's, uh, and it's on to the next. But, you know, if you're not kind of fostering and cultivating that relationship before they get here, it, it's definitely going to take longer and it's going to be tougher for them. And you touched on the timing piece. That was where we started also, just because they're not going to see the consistent velocity and stuff that they see at the college level. And so they can get away with not having great timing in high school. And and honestly, bad timing works off bad high school pitchers. Yeah, sure. So that was always the place we needed to start was to show them our better hitters that we had had with their timing was off the pitcher, what better elite hitters at the at the pro level. But I think that's the biggest adjustment is they, they may have a great swing, but just not very good timing. Yeah. So it's funny you said that. This is the first year. The biggest low-hanging fruit to me, and it's, it's not very talked about, which is astonishing in baseball, is if you ask coaches and you go around to different teams and say, how many – how many teams have fully assessed all their hitters eyes? Yes. Have you, have everybody got an extensive eye exam from, from a doctor who knows what they're doing? And so this, we spent money this year to bring in a sports doctor from a sports vision doctor from 
Indianapolis. And it's, it's, he's been, been on the podcast with me. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And I think actually, so credit goes to you. That's why I heard yeah. so <laughs> I I Joe, Dr. Joe, Hey, shout out Dr. Yeah. Joe. He was, yeah, he was yeah. phenomenal. And Absolutely. Bailey Montgomery helped me set that up. He's at Miami of Ohio who played for me at Western. So the baseball, the baseball rabbit hole goes way deep, way deep. I literally, I literally was cutting the grass and I listened to your podcast with him and I called him after flew him out and he did it. And the guys are doing stuff. And it's a it's crazy to see when he's like people just think of, of 2010 right <laughs> but there's moving objects there's how your brain processes it there's are certain areas there's far there's there's so many there's so much more that goes into that so it's funny you said that because it's it's just a low-hanging fruit and if you can't see the ball and your timing and vision is 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 off you're you're not gonna hit so we, we hey when did he meet time. with your guys just for coaches that are interested in that yeah, I, when did I he come to, in I had him come out the first week. So it was the it. very yeah, the very first thing we did was was kind of go through all this, assess who who needed some some in doctor visits with a local guy that he knew, you know, who needs this program, who doesn't need it at all, and, and just kind of go through that and and educate the kids, you know, hey, this is why you struggle with the breaking ball down. You 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 really struggle seeing below your knees. And that part, if you can help someone and, and it's something that that is corrective. Uh, and the reason why before your podcast, which really triggered me, Ben Cowles was someone that we had last year who's with the Yankees and man, it took him years. He really struggled, uh, didn't know if he was ever really going to hit. And, and a lot of his stuff was getting the correct division, uh, and, and buying into some other stuff and boom, he has 18 home runs last year and led the conference. So you don't know when someone's going to pop and you don't know necessarily what it is. So, you know, I, I think for coaches out there as a whole, we need to do a better job in baseball, just getting these kids assessed, and it's a it's a low hanging fruit for sure. Well, at least you know then as a coach, uh, because yeah, sure. you may be doing all the right things with a player, all the right drills, talking all the right language, and it may just be that they need some help with their eyes. Correct, totally agree. And so it, it you know it just makes things a little bit easier. Hey, is your development calendar similar for your returning guys then with your new guys? So when you first get them in, uh, are they on similar paths with the drills that you're doing? Or are you you tailoring for your older guys, your returning guys is a little bit different? Yeah, I coach every guy differently. Yeah. So every single guy has an individual program. Nobody's ever doing the same things. So it could be, you know, we always start with a move prep. So the corrective issues for a move prep, you know, say he struggles with the brakes, the lead leg. Uh, say he gets stuck on his backside, you know, there's all different types of things with water bags, uh, you know, med balls, all different types of stuff. So no, not one of our players is doing the same thing. Every single player uh, has an individual program and I try to coach them their strengths. Maxwell Costas is a huge power hitting first baseman. He's not going to be doing the same things that my scrappy second baseman that runs a six, five, 60 is going to do. I don't think that, you know, helps them. And the biggest thing with that development to me, is them becoming their own best coach. So if you start with that, you know, eventually by, you know, two and three months, by the time they get home to Christmas, they're going home to their parents, they're going home to their hitting guy, and they're able to tell them and they're able to explain to them. And we know personally, the differences between minor league and major league guys and major league all-stars is the adjustments from pitch to pitch because they know what they need to do. So I try to start that from day one. And, and that's something that empowers them to just say, hey, it's, it's, it's not what I tell you to do. It's, it's you understanding exactly who you are and what you need to work with um, in order to be your best self. How long have you used the water bags? Uh, a couple of years. So, you know, I started seeing stuff more in, you know, I used to be big into fitness and I started seeing it there. And then I read uh, Bill Parisi's book on fascia. So I'm big on the fascia training and stuff like that and saw him use a bunch of different stuff. And Eugene Bleeker was was one of the first ones I, I saw uh, 108 performance uh, do it. So it's it's been probably two or three years, uh, but it's something that I think is a game changer. I think I view the move prep a, as actual reps. Yeah. So, you know, if we're doing turns or you're doing holds or you're doing some type of fascial sling work. It's those are those are just as important as the reps that you're getting hitting. And if you get kids to understand that and coaches think how much time people waste. If you just warm up for 10 minutes and you go through the motions, think how much time can be wasted in that year after year after year. 
So we try to stress the importance as as soon as you walk in here, everything matters. And I showed them Lamont Wade one day. I showed them, you know, some video of him and I just took it and he didn't know it from the second he walks in that cage. Every single thing that he does is deliberate. It doesn't have to be a ton, but everything he does is deliberate. And that's the difference to me between big leaguers and high school and college guys. Well, and that saves you time too, as a, as a player, if you're deliberate with your practice, you don't need as many reps. Nope. 100%. And that's, that's the hardest part, right? We're talking about failure. What do most guys do? They come in, they turn the machine on or they do flips and they take a thousand reps. And then in their mind, they check the box and they say, Oh, I worked hard. So I deserve success. When me and you know, it doesn't matter how many reps you take. That doesn't mean you're going to have success. So that's a coaching piece and education piece as well. You're right is, Hey man, I I stopped talking about rounds. So if a kid, you say five rounds, he's fixated on five every single time. His mind is not built on performance. Okay. So if it's the third rep and he hits three in a row, get out, I kick him out. And now what you'll see is over time, guys start to walk out on their own and it's not a, it's not a check the box coach thing that doesn't work. So when you get them more in terms of thinking about performance and what they need to do, that's when you'll see a little bit of a mind shift. I did the same thing as a player. If I took five swings in a row off the tee and I lined it to the back of the cage, I moved on to the next thing because I was like, okay, it's there. I'm, I'm moving on to the next thing. 100%. Though. The best thing Lamont Wade told me was how Buster Posey went about his, his business. That guy, he was so locked in and knew exactly what he needed to do in his game prep. He does a left-handed breaking ball every day and and a right center gap. And he he took the least amount of swings of anybody on that team because he was a seasoned pro. He knew exactly what he needed to do to get his body to perform. And he was mentally confident in that. And that's all we're striving for, especially in this game of failure. Hey, when you read Parisi's book, I mean, what made the light bulb go on as you read? And I know it's a deep, deep, Derry Weinstein have talked about it. I know it's a deep dive book. But what yeah. kind of what what lit you up when you're reading it? Uh, how much we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, th- I think as coaches, man, and I'm like this, you can get pulled in so many areas, right? Like I try to spend a lot of time. I gave a presentation at Bridge the Gap with uh, with our strength coach, and and there's so many different silos, right? You can get pulled in every possible direction, and sometimes it can be overwhelming as a coach because you have to fit it all in your eight hours of off season and 20 hours in season. And it's overwhelming. And and you realize that, Hey, there's a lot of things that I don't know. So I think that's the part of the growth mindset and the part of just continuing to want to learn and pick things from other people and make it your own. That makes this game so great because it's not about the data. It's not about, you know, this book or that book It's how you can incorporate that in the time you have and apply it to a specific player to make them better. So initially the book is, I, I, th- I thought it was a great read. And obviously he's, you know, you know, he's known all over the world with his yeah. different schools. I think there's going to be way more with fascia that you'll see that comes out in the next couple of years and how much actually more important it is and maybe some musc- musculatory stuff. But uh, it's like fantastic. a wetsuit for the body is the way they always explain it. It's a 100%. wetsuit for the body. 100%. Hey, how do you handle that? There's so much information out there. How do you how do you know and how do you handle cuz everybody does this different when you're going to maybe add something new in or hey, that's not great. Um we might try it. It's not great and I'm just going to stay with kind of what I'm doing on some things too. I just try to always look at the performance. Uh the ball doesn't lie, right? Okay. So, I think for me, am I being efficient with my time? You know, are they getting enough? Am I getting the, the core values from the hitting perspective or the team perspective in, and you can just kind of see the performance there. There isn't a year I've ever coached or been around baseball where I've done the same things. Yeah. So I think in this game, it it's not an infinite amount of time. And that's, that's what, why I think hitting guys in the major leagues go to private coaches because they can take two and three hours on their craft. They can have these long conversations. College coaches know, man, it is a grind. You do not have the time you know, to take guys here in the cage earlier or after and all that. And, and with their filling out surveys of how much time they're there, you're, you're really hampered with what you can actually do, even if it helps the kid. Yeah. So it's more of a trial and error thing. And I don't want to say trial, like I'm just throwing things out there. That no, I, it's I, experimentation. Yeah, for sure. I, I think it's, 
you know, is it, is it this amount of time a day on move prep? Is it this amount of time uh, on, on the feel part or, or cues? So what, what I think we do a really good job of is we, we hit before practice and, and they'll come in with me in the cage and they know that's a time to, to be exploratory and, and feel and do that and have questions and it's okay. And then when it's time to whatever we're doing for the task for the day in practice or hitting or, or what it's time to compete. And, and it's not a time to come over and ask me about your swing. So I think you have to, you have to have that line where they feel safe enough to, to know that they're working on things or doing some things to help them. But there's also got to be a time where it's, Hey man, you're not going to feel good. <laughs> you're going to be sore. Baseball is a game of, of, you know, ups and downs with the body. So when you're out there, there's a time to just grind it out and compete. You know, it's almost go time for you guys. So as you get closer to the season, how much is it constraint drills or some of the other drills and then live ball stuff where it's just get in there and, and execute? Yeah. So what we do is, I, you know, I'll mix in some drills with with a, a flip on, in the V flex or something for vision. And then I'll immediately do the same constraint off the machine uh, with like a timing shoot on it. So I, I, I always gear it towards, hey, Yes, you're getting some work in, but there's going to be a performance aspect with with this machine or something. And I, and I have a love hate relationship with the machines, right? It's hard, you know. It's just something that as coaches, you know, we can't replicate. So, um, you know, so I always try to make sure that we're doing the reps, but also right now before the season, we're we're putting them, you know, in some some velo stuff or whether I'm throwing or stuff like that, and then out on the field, I think the spin ball has been a game changer. You know, you can use the iPad where you're mixing pitches. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with zone discipline. So out on the field, we'll, we'll use more of the, the live machine with the, with the spin ball stuff and mix and match and make it hard on them. And inside, we're still doing a little bit of the mini hack and performance stuff, but uh, they're, they're actually doing the constraints on that, knowing that, hey, they can still do it if they're efficient and they slow themselves down. Hey, talk about the timing shoots because I, I know it's starting to get some play. And shout out to Josh Raby out of Quincy, Illinois. But uh, I like the timing shoots, and he welded those on his own before he started making those for other people in Quincy, Illinois. But talk about what it's done with the machine work. Well, we just got them. So it's something that I'm – that was my love-hate with relationships is a lot of coaches think that you train to hit velo just by hitting velo and – that's not necessarily true. Your brain just wants to get the task completed. It does not want to be efficient. So that's the tough part of machines. You have to really coach the fact that, hey, get more caught up in your timing of what you're doing. And if your timing isn't good on the machine, throw the rep out. And too many kids or too many coaches, they're just assessing what they're doing on the swing when it could have been a timing thing. So that's always been my issue with the machines. They're great but it sacrifices the player's efficiency of how he should move. And I'll give you an example. Christian Yelich is not going to have the same move off a machine that Mike Trout is. Yep. Uh, even though Mike Trout has a leg kick, uh, he's a little bit tighter. He's, he's more compact. Christian Yelich is long. He can't help it. He's going to have a bigger move. Yep. So if you just put the same 95 mile an hour machine on both, it's, it's not going to work the same. They have to be focused on being efficient and their timing in order to get a good rep off the machine. Yeah. So that's a big education piece, but the timing shoots help with that. You now have the timing shoots and they can kind of get their, their timing and efficiency. And that's something that I think is a great idea by him and a game changer for sure. And it, Monty Lee actually was the one that said, Hey, I've seen a difference with my guys over Clemson uh, kind of using these. And this is, this has been kind of eliminating the hiccup of, of the love hate with the machine. Yeah. Liberty has them. I, when I was going out, not this past fall, uh, during COVID two falls ago, when we we're trying to get content, I was starting to see it more and more, uh, with guys attaching those to the machines. And then you're using the farm boards now too. I mean, how long have you, how long have you mixed the farm boards in? Yeah, I, I give a shout out to Joey Kuna. Uh, we, we've been close to ever since he was with Bleak. So I got tied in with, with Bleaker at 108. And, you know, he wrote a great book and, and really bucked the trend of a lot of, of what's happening out there with bat speed and, and the way that maybe people think in terms of movement. And then, you know, I, I have Donnie Ecker and Rob Van Skoyak and guys like that and Joey and, and Eugene. So do you uh, have everybody use those? Everybody. Uh, there's the one, the one thing that's non-negotiable to me is the ground. It's absolutely a non-negotiable. Uh, 
Hey, you when know, you're doing that with guys now, how many are are they going straight farm boards, or are you mixing farm boards in and then ground? Are you alternating? How are you prescribing those? You're coaching for me right now. Yeah, I mean, I, you start slow, right? You can use them on the med ball. You can you can do kind of a progression, but yeah, it just depends on what they need. If a guy gets stacked, use it more and, and understand you're trying to get that torque and, and use the ground away. Way some guys that don't block well on the front, you can use it for. Uh, you could use both. So it's once they kind of get going now, I do a lot of every others. So it's important that they understand the difference. So I'll have them do a rep, then, then get out with it and do a rep then get out. So I think just baseball players as a whole, and there's a whole different discussion on, on motor learning, but uh, I think they can get some feels and understand how sped up they are when the ground is taken away. And it's, it's single-handedly the most important product I use every day. It has so many different aspects that you can do. And and unfortunately, most college coaches like myself, I don't I don't have force plates in my hitting cage. You know, I, I don't have a screen up there telling me how he's using the ground. So and I also have eight hitters after that that are jumping in and out doing different things. So for me, you can really see, you know, are, are they pushing out? Are they getting stuck or are they using the torque in the ground? Right. Are they using the right force? And it's immediate and they start to know it. So. It's definitely something that I use daily and, and shout out to him. It's a great product, uh, very simplistic. It's cheap. Every coach should have it. Every pro guy that I, that I train in the off season and my guys, it's a, it's an absolute staple. I've seen guys use carpet runners too. Uh, sure. You know, if they didn't have the farm boards, they, they're they using the carpet runners for hitters and for, for pitchers also for their prep work. For sure. And you can get creative if you have that stuff, but this, that the board's definitely cheap enough that, that it's worth the investment. Any drills that you're holding on to that you used as a player, maybe early on in, in coaching? Are there ones that you've kept? Man, I, I tell you, as time goes on, I think so many different coaches are trying to add so much in there. I'm, I'm consistently trying to get rid of stuff out of the toolbox. And that's another thing is just because you can do something or you have variety or have ideas doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a good thing. Yeah. So what I try to do is, is, I'll use specific things, but, but you got to have some consistency with it, you know, and, and they got to have a total understanding of why they're using it and how they're used in the ground. So for, for me, I'm trying to get rid of more than I am trying to add stuff. It doesn't mean you're not learning. It doesn't mean you don't do stuff like that, but I'm 100% more always focused on how we stop. I think hitting is about more how you stop than how you accelerate or rotate. And that's, that's, you know, contrarian to a lot of people that may listen to this, but Greg Rose talks about a, a lot of this yeah. stuff with TPI and he's a former Terp shout out to the Terps. Um, and he does a great job. It's the same thing in golf. So I, I spent a lot of time on the premise of the breaks using the ground. I, I rarely talk about swing mechanics rarely. And that people are shocked by that, but I, I never, if you get a kid to use the ground, right. And, and get him to be his best athletic self. That's what I did with Lamont Wade. Uh, guys are going to have an east-west path. Mike Schmidt, who's never going to tell Mike Schmidt that his east-west path was bad? You know, and then you got a J.D. Martinez that's a little bit longer, more upright, that's north-south. So there, there's not one path. There's not one way to swing. We have to, as coaches, understand what their body wants to do and fit it to that. It's not what the coach wants. It's not maybe the swing that he wants that looks pretty. What does his body want him to do? And it's hard for coaches to look at it like that. How much time does it take the guys to pick those drills up in the fall when they first get there, when you're introducing them? It's quick, man. I like how we do the fall. We don't jump right in. We, we take the, the first three or four weeks and do individuals, and that's critical for me to, to be able to teach that. So I'll do a segment just, just on, on torque force of the back leg and how we use the ground. Uh, I'll, I'll do something just on, on how important it is for, for the front foot to, to break and be that emergency break. I'll do a day just on water bags. I'll do a day just on med ball stuff. So <clears throat> that's a critical time for me uh, for, for to teach that and lay the foundation early. So they're not overwhelmed. They start to get the understanding of it. And, and over time, you know, conversations with, with your strength coach is huge too. There's too many different silos with that strength coach could be trained in football or, or, or just a general NSCA type of certification and trains every team the same. And that's not how it works in baseball. This is an elastic sport. Uh, we got to be careful with how much strength that we actually have. And that's why the injuries have gone up. So I think the conversations with the strength coaches and uh, making sure that you're on the same page with that can also accelerate players' development, hitting. 
We would show bad swings to like good contact, like hard contact home runs on bad swings and show the difference of what, what a mechanical breakdown looks like in order to make contact with balls out of the zone, that it's not going to be your best bolt. Like I think A-Rod was a good example of that. Vlad Guerrero was a good example. So we, we dig in on some, some really good bad ball hitters to show them that like, hey, your swing may be ugly sometimes on balls out of the zone, especially with two strikes emergency mode swings. That okay, it may look a little funky at times, but the end result might be good. Listen, man, there's there something has to revert in Major League Baseball and college baseball. It has to has to revert back at some time. I there the I don't have any problem with data. We use a lot. We have the Acrotech. Trust me, it's a it's a it's a good tool. But the tail has started to wag the dog, and the days of just bat to ball and performance and, and, and things like that. We are assessing people on the wrong things. And I don't have any problem with power. We all love home runs. We, we don't like, you know, chop ground balls. That's not what we're saying, but something has to give where we're focused more on if my second baseman, if Brandon Lau, his freshman year came in and I was judging him on his exit velocity, if he couldn't get above 90 and he was either punished, or I would have never game. played. If you were exactly judging, because we we took our exit velocity in the '90s, it was janky how we did it. But my exit <laughs> velocity wasn't good, and I had almost 300 hits in college. Like I would have okay. had a hard time with my size and what my metrics yeah. are. I don't. I may not have been able to play college baseball now. Yeah. So we we give them rake reports where you know I, I'm more obsessed with the process. Are you swinging strikes? Are you swinging at balls? But then I pocket them. So if his average exit velocity is is 83, but he's killing it, barrel bat to ball, I put him in that category where he doesn't feel like he doesn't see that it's that, that it's based on exit velocity. So I, I think that you know with just today, it's, you're you're exactly right. The Vlads. The, all the different stances. Randall Simon the, was another one. He was chin to shoe tops. <laughs> oh, I grew. I was. I'm a diehard Orioles fan, and just you know the, the Tony Batistas and the Cow. I'm looking at Cow Ripken on a Wheaties box right now downstairs, and he switched his stance every two weeks, and I would go out like him and and try different things and do that. So I think there's going to be something that reverts back at some point, just on the performance level. And yes, pitchers are good. Yes. Yeah, that's always the first thing people say. Yes. The velocity is better and all that, but there's also more walks than ever. So if there's people behind 3-1, do you think Barry Bonds or really good hitters are going to have a problem getting their swing off? No, that's just a timing thing. So there's an argument for everything. And they, just- they hit in a smaller zone in those counts too. You know, for that sure. he was so good of shrinking what he was looking for, way easier to hit if you're trying to hit into a smaller area than cover a, a wide area. They were so good with shrinking and and – that's why he walked a lot too, because his three one count was was a cookie, yeah. and he was going to take a pitcher's pitch in that count to go to three two if he needed to. But he walked a lot in that situation too. Yeah, I just think there just needs to be a mix. You know, I yes. mean, there's definitely there's definitely all that. I just hope we we start to shift the focus for kids' mind because they come in and they can give me all these different things, but they don't understand. It's the new mechanics. The data yeah. is the new mechanics. Yeah. They don't understand how they're getting there. And for me, that's the hard part of coaching is you have to reframe the mind to get to that point. Do you talk much to strike approach? Man, I, I've talked about this for 20 years. Uh, so for me, I, this is unpopular. I don't even care what it looks like. Just make contact. Yeah. I, you talked about the bad ball hitters. Uh, there's studies out there that when you actually choke up and spread out and you change the actual mechanic of, of your setup, it, it does you a disservice. For sure. Know? But but I, when you did it, sometimes if, if you got a hit and it made you feel more confident, then it works. Yeah. <laughs> so that confidence piece is a real thing. So for us, man, you know, we're trying to have a less than two strike approach for sure. And then a two strike approach. You can go back and look at the numbers, even in Major League Baseball for the last 50 years. I think there's only been a couple of years where if they make contact with two strikes or batting average is, is over 300. And for the people that want to sacrifice power and all that, I couldn't care less. I think college is still a different game. And you know, whatever is going to get that guy confidence and, and mentally more to clear his mind to be able to still continue to battle and don't let those nerves creep in uh, is is just as important. So now I've, I've gone back and forth and tried everything. There's all different types of things that work. But for, for me, it's just it's just trying to, to, to simply make contact. We would film from behind with their two strike approach to make sure that their eyes were the same setup. So we didn't really care as much, okay, choke up, get on the plate or whatever. 
but we wanted their eyes to be in the same spot in their setup so they weren't changing what they were looking at visually. And where maybe because I think that's what happens when guys spread out too much with two strikes is their eye level now changes. So they're seeing they're seeing the release point and the ball coming at them differently. So they're going to actually swing at more more balls because they're changing where their eyes are in their setup. I think for us too, we focus so much on the process of zone discipline. So I only get, I don't post stats. I don't post anything. I post their hitter efficiency rating, which I created, which is simply swinging at strike and swinging at balls. We focus on that so much along with the V flex. It's a product that, that gets your eyes to train binocularly together uh, along with some of the stuff we're doing with the vision stuff. So I'm super confident in the daily day-to-day preparation yeah. that we're training so much on the eyes you know, I don't have to talk as much about that because they know they're training to swing at strikes and take balls. Yeah. So that's made it easier from that aspect as well. Hey, what are some of the best in-game routines or dugout routines you've seen out of your players? Yeah, I think it just has to be a culture thing. You know, we, we've used, you know, Brian before. We've used different guys that have come in and, and we've learned stuff over the years. And uh, for me, it's just being consistent. I, I have them give me a three-by-five card of what they're going to do uh, in the dugout on deck and in the box. And I don't, as long as they have a few things, you know, a certain breath a release, uh, I, I want it to be kind of theirs and I don't want it to be forced, but the biggest thing for me in baseball, I think paying attention is a skill. I, I just do. It's, it's not something that comes naturally. It's hard to pay attention. And if you pay attention, you can get 30 mental at bats a game. So if that's really you can talk about the on deck routine. You can talk about the breath. You can talk about the inbox. Yes. You can't play at a high level if you don't slow the game down, but the emphasis on getting those, all those at bats mentally in the game by just paying attention is, is night and day to how much that can do for your development. So we talk a lot about that and something I try to harp on my guys, like a kid that's maybe not in the game. Hey man, what, what have you saw? Oh, oh the last three innings, you know, or what, what, what have you seen? And, and if he doesn't have an answer, I know he's not paying attention. It's not to scare a kid. It's just something that if they start to get in the mold of, of what he would do to them and how they're going to co- uh, pitch him, I, I think it just serves your hitters. For yeah, sure. and I was going to ask you scouting reports or communication in the dugout, like how much communication, how much information are you sharing with them? Man, that's another thing over past 10 years. I think with the data revolution is is there's it's easy to overwhelm, but this comes back to me knowing my players. Yeah. I know exactly what they need. I know if they can watch video. I know if they don't need the video because it's too much and they're cerebral. So we give them a certain amount. You give them a plan. Um, There's definitely some data and some trends and some little things here and there, but you have to be very careful. So I've taken a lot of time talking to Rob Van Skoyak at the Dodgers or Donnie Ecker when he was with the Giants. What are you doing? What's what's the game prep? You know, is this is this more for for a major league guy? How can I dial this back for a college guy? I spent probably the last four months mostly on those topics because I'm most interested in how to prepare guys and also give information. But I still think it comes from the relationships. You just have to know what certain guys can handle and and kind of just kind of just go from there. So you give them the resources, uh, but your plan has to be ironclad and simplistic. And this is for the high school and travel coaches listening in. What would you like to see out of players coming into your program that maybe they aren't getting right now before they get to you? Uh, loyal, more loyalty, uh, more, more competition. Uh, I, and again, I'm not, I think it's such a wonderful resource. It allows coaches to recruit all summer, but I think the trend of when I was at the math of high school, it was the most important aspect for me to beat Gonzaga and to beat St. John's and those local schools. It was, it was ingrained in who I was. It was the school pride. And I think the shift of some kids aren't even playing high school anymore and they're just playing summer and, and stuff like that. You just want to make sure that the competition piece is never sacrificed nor jumping from AAU or, or travel ball team to travel ball team becomes a thing because it fits the narrative for them better so, I, you know, I would like to see a little bit more of just the competition and the, it's, it's not necessarily the care level, but, but just, just that, that camaraderie that you have with, with stuff that you're with. So, uh, like I said, it's, there's always pros and cons to everything, but I think the more that guys can be with the same organization for a certain amount of years and be developed and understand 
the skill level. It's great that they can play more games than anybody. That they don't ever practice has. as much now, though. It's a big piece. They don't. Pra- well, who'd you play with in the summer when you were coming up? Oh, you know how it was back then. You were playing Legion. That was yep. like the thing. I never forget. I mean, Mark Desher is a Maryland guy. Is the same year as me. Every year we played them twice, and that was like the highlight. You knew you were going to go play Mike T- Mark Desher and Gavin Floyd. And, and you're playing and for a tournament at the end of the year. You know, I, I think cool. that's the the piece that we can continue to nudge. Um, you know, the toothpaste isn't going back in. I think that's the thing you could nudge is to get away from every weekend's a championship. Let's build for one championship at the end of the year. And by the way, it's a tournament format. So if you lose once you're out, yeah. you know, I, I think that's the, the, where you could bring the competitive piece back where you're building. Cause that's the college season. The college season is you're playing for the conference championship then you're playing for a conference tournament championship then you're playing to go to the omaha you know there's a build-up and then there is also that pressure of of one game and you might be out yeah and and i I get it for for everything and it, it makes sense and there's definitely good organizations but i'm spending time in the fall teaching some very basic things that i felt like i knew in eighth and ninth grade and that is just that is just how it's going and it's a trend and with all the information that we have out there and the resources we have that's inexcusable yes so um yeah there like i said there there's cycles man you know major league baseball that you know things will revert to certain things and, and maybe not but it definitely makes it more challenging and, and um harder to harder to coach when they get here did you play fall baseball in high school Yes. So back then was the first one, the, the Orioleanders just started. Uh, the Orioleanders, that's yeah. a shout out. I, yeah. That was interesting for me coming from Indiana and growing up in Indiana and coaching in Indiana. There was no fall baseball in, in Indiana. And yeah. so when I got out to the East Coast to JMU, that was, I loved it. Well, David Wright was coming out at that point. Yeah. You know, the Tidewater Mets, but the Orioleanders had a great program. Yeah. So I, I never played for them. I, I wanted to, and I wasn't lucky enough. So but yeah, it was those, it was stuff like the rookies, but I, you know, we, at the math, I think being at a, a Catholic high school that was, had a great program at the time, we had a fall schedule and it was great, but I was also playing basketball and football. So it, it was a challenge trying to do all three, but again, we can get onto the multi-sport stuff. It, that also defined who I was, um, sitting the bench in basketball, the math, I never played, but the ins and outs of practices and playing versus Joe Forte and Keith Bogans every day and stuff like that made me a, a better baseball player. Yeah, that we can we can dive into the multi-sport. I, I see both sides of it. And and just like in anything, I think the ones that are athletic enough to, to do it uh, should do it. But I, I do like the competitive piece outside of your main sport. But I the best thing that ever happened to me in high school is that my high school soccer coach cut me my junior year of <laughs> – oh, seriously – because I, I loved soccer. I, I loved it. Soccer was my favorite sport growing up and was in a really competitive high school, Catholic high school. Baseball and soccer were the two best sports, won a lot of state championships. Don Mattingly had gone to that high school. But the best thing that Coach Veith did for me was cut me my junior year because then it allowed me to focus just on, on the training part of it and baseball. But I would have liked to have keep playing. But you can't look back now and say like one thing. I don't know, but it, it helped me. But I do agree that guys need to, the guys that can keep doing multiple sports need to do it. But you, then you have a Trevor Bauer outlier. Like, I think it's a case by case basis, like who's who, who it works for. I, I totally agree. I, I think I think that kind of dictates itself. I just hate to see kids quit because they're pressured into certain pockets, yes. I guess is a better way to say it. So I, I think 100 percent it's a case by case. And some kids just need to get strong and, and don't need to do that. And that's actually going to hurt their career. So. But I just, I just hate. But an eight-year-old kid doesn't need to focus on one sport. A twelve-year-old kid doesn't need to focus on one sport. A fourteen-year-old kid doesn't need to sp- focus on one sport. Yeah, uh, totally they need good. to try to to do as much as they can. And, and you talked about the the health. There's health issues now with our kids that have played one sport coming through because you just you can't balance that out. Now, youth coaches can help because the the warm up piece. They can change their warm ups to make sure their their single sport athletes are working other parts of their body outside of their sport. Like the the youth and travel coaches can help that by adding a better warm up in for their players. I agree. Yep. I agree. Do you have a fail forward moment? 
Yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, man, my sister died of cancer in her 30s. I was in my 20s. I was just getting out of Pro Bowl. So it's, it's not really a fail forward moment. I went through, a, a, my brother died in high school. So that was the first time I ever dealt with anxiety. I didn't know what it was. It was something that I was going into the hospital almost every day. And even just the smell of the alcohol and in the hospital was the first time I really had a panic attack and had anxiety. I had no idea what it was. I thought I was having a heart attack. And I did too. The, I've had yeah. them. I had, yeah. I had was, to go to the a, hospital. I had thought I was yeah. having a heart attack. It was really an eye-opening moment for, for me and just understood that, you know, going through those real life things and certain things that were tough um, exposed me to a lot. It, it was a really rough time in my life and for my family and my parents and having to go through that again. So uh, that's really it. It's, it's not necessarily something in coaching or sports. It was something that was really tragic for me at a younger age. And it, it really shapes who I am now. And, you know, what, what Rob, Rob Vaughn, our head coach now, what we try to do is, is it's shaped and woven through everything and who I am with our culture, uh, how we treat our kids, the, the mental aspect and uh, what we do from, from a, a philanthropy side and, and, and charity too. How did you finally get the anxiety to calm down? It's every day and it's a battle, you know, even, even maybe something coming on here, you know, it's, it's early, the baby's crying, you're trying to run down. It's, it's an everyday thing. It never goes away. It, it's something that can always trigger. There's, a, there's always something, you know, through the deaths or, or through something that that's going to trigger it. So it, it's kind of like an addiction per se. It, it's, it's never just going to fully go away. You just have to, embrace it to a certain extent, be open and honest about it with people. And, uh, and, and, and I think that's the best way I go about it. So it's something that doesn't just magically go away. It's something that you have to work towards and, um, and, and something that, that it's there you know, daily for sure. The daily practice helps me the most because yeah. I'll, you can always feel well, it's like during the convention or whatever, you're up on stage. And so I, I can feel the anxiety, but the amount of work that I do every day allows me to center back in, focus on my breathing when I need to. And it's really hard for the people that don't have those skills built in or haven't practiced those skills. It's extremely debilitating um, just because yeah. then once you get into fight and flight, fight or flight, um, it's extremely hard. Uh, yeah. Stoicism has helped me too. I do a lot with Ryan Holiday and the Daily Stoic um, has helped me a lot too. That's I think a, it, that's it, a great book. One of, one of my favorites. Great. That, call his right three there. minute daily thing is awesome. Uh, that's what I listen to when I warm up is the Daily Stoic, his audio, because it, it gets you to focus on the right things and understand that the the life journey is there's a lot of things that are going to happen to you on your life journey. And that's part of expecting, obviously you never want anything tragic to happen, but that's what we all sign up for as humans is that there's going to be tragedies that you're dealing. I just had a, a former player from Iowa just passed away, uh, Skylar Moss. So I'm going back to Iowa city here this weekend um, to, for his services, but you just, you don't expect any of that, but it, that's what happens in life. It's part of our life journey. Yeah, I think the hardest thing for me during that time and why it got so bad was the first time I kind of looked around, I was a little bit naive in high school when it happened to me, but everybody else's life goes on. <laughs> yes. You're in this, you feel like you're in this tunnel where you're going through the worst thing in your life, but everybody else is continuing to go. And that was, I went for years and years around not being able to wrap my head around that yeah. instead of shifting more towards the acceptance aspect of it. So yeah, man, I, I, I totally understand. Hey, what helped you get closure with your brother and sister's situations or have you gotten closure? I mean, you're, you're always going to have those reminders of them, yeah. but what allowed you to maybe start the healing process? I just acceptance. It's, it's no longer punishment or like I said, just the birthdays and, and any trigger is a bad thing. It's just more of acceptance. And yes. that's the hardest thing to do in addiction and depression. Anxiety is getting to that point. So I've tried to going through those things, use that as fuel to help my kids and other people. And if, if you look at it from an acceptance point of just like, yes, that was tough. Uh, I can't change that. It, it, it was, it was, something I can't control, but, but what can I do to, to help others? Or what can I do to just keep putting one foot in front of the other? And, you know, faith has a lot to do with that and surrounding yourself with good people. I've been with Rob Vaughn for 10 years. 
and, and if you, if I was working for someone or working with people that triggered that or, or were in a consistently bad environment, I wouldn't be there. So I think that's also a part of surrounding you. You're the, they say you're the, the average of the five most people you spend time with. So uh, that's, that's a big piece too, for sure. You talked about the morning meditation. Do you have any other morning routines? You have kids, so it's almost impossible to do anything outside of maybe a, a, a minute yeah. here, a minute there. But do you have any other routines? And it could be maybe something you do outside the morning that, that helps you. Uh, there's a book called, the I think it's called The White Elephant. But what I try to do every two weeks is is pick something out. So what's kind of cool with that is not check the phone. So I'll do the breath work. I'll do the meditation. And then every two weeks, I try to switch something. So I'll try to brush my teeth left-handed for two weeks yeah. uh, and do stuff like that. And that's just, that's something that doesn't take time. It's just being mindful and in the moment to do something. And that alone will reset some stuff. Because you know, and I know the, the baby is six months right now. She's... <laughs> She's going to eat. She's going to eat when she wants to eat and she's going to do what she wants to do. But I can still brush my teeth with my left hand while I hold her with my right. So there's little things like that, that, that people don't really understand. You can still bring mindfulness. You can still be present. You can still do things like that. They're that going to set up your day to be successful as opposed to waking up and looking at social media, looking at the email. There's a time for that. For but sure. Give yourself, give yourself a grace period, man. Give yourself a grace period of, you know, 20 minutes or a half hour to, to, to do some type of routine. And, you know how it is, man. You've done such a great job with these podcasts. You're, you do amazing work. You, you just have to be consistent. It has to be something that you actually do. If it's one thing and you execute it, that's a win. And, and, and that's really what it comes down to. People and it is to the one thing. Like, just choose one thing. Um, yeah. Mine was wristwatch on the other hand for a while. Um, yeah. You know, it helps you rewire. We're all just a bottle. Talk about fascia, but we're all just a bunch of jumbled habits. 100%. Like that's, that's all we are. So if you can do something outside your normal habits, it helps rewire your brain to help the next time you try to add another habit in. Um, it's, it's fascinating when you read it because just one thing could be the, the linchpin to, to leading to other things that happen for you in a positive. Yeah. Rewiring that mind is a real thing. The central nervous system is so powerful. So it's something that's amazing. Hey, you played in the ACC and now Big Ten. What is going to the Big Ten done for Maryland? Oh man, this is also a tough question for me. <laughs> I I was so grew up in the era of you know you can see behind me. I have Joe Smith, Len Bias jerseys up here. You know I'm a diehard Maryland fan. So for me, with a nine team ACC, it was you know we weren't very good then, but it was so good it, it was it was such an amazing league i had so many great experiences uh it really it really shaped all i knew so it was a jolt and a jar for sure uh, i understand totally from a perspective of college athletics and, and transition and the big 10 network and the money and all that so it's been tough personally just because it was all i knew and and all my rivalries were based in and stuff just growing up through my childhood but uh, I think, but the Big Ten resources have helped change your program. Yeah, I, you know, and I was in the Big Ten. Like those resources are are yeah. ridiculous. Well, it too. It's just you know we we were in a, a difficult position money wise, and and we're we're in uh, College Park. I'm, we're our campus is is five miles from DC. Yeah. If you're not relevant at Maryland and sports, uh, you, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, we have museums. We have. <laughs> the commanders we have the wizards we have the ravens we have the orioles we have the nationals we have the capitals we have so many different things within 15 miles that the pressure here is so much higher so the things they're doing to try to get those resources i totally understand and we're creating rivalries hey every time i'm close with backage but every time we play him you better believe there's a little extra you know extra incentive that you know i want to beat them um you know, and I have a great relationship with him. So we're, we're building those rivalries, you know, the Rutgers and, you know, from Steve Owen days at Brian, we, we kind of have that as well. So we're building that. It's, it's just it's just something that's going to take time. And the good thing is, is that the kids that are here don't know any different. You know, they, they don't know any different from when we went in in 2015. And so that that's something that at least for them, they kind of see that. And um, great coaches you know, in the Big Ten, by the way. Great coaches. Yeah, Every great program coaches. has good coaches. Oh man, Rick, Rick Heller is another guy, one of my favorites. A uh, close guy with him. Just Will's just, done a good job at Nebraska yeah. now. Like it's Will's done, yeah, yep. Will's done a great job. Yeah, there's there's tons of coaches. I go on and on, but it's yep. and it. I felt last year we got kind of slighted, definitely in the tournament. We we you know we got 
conference only. And it was, it was yeah, okay. that hurt you guys last year was just having to go conference only. Yeah, it crushed us. But the competition was really good. I thought the teams, you know, we could have had five teams in last year yeah. uh, for sure. So, but the, con- the the baseball is much better than people think. And anybody that thinks that they schedule us, they're, they're I mean, going to get can play in the college world series yeah. four years sure. ago. Like it's, yeah. sure. it's good. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. What are some final thoughts? Oh man, just, just thank you. know, I'm thankful that you had me on. I appreciate it. It's, it's been great for all the resources that you guys have had. I was so bummed. I couldn't go to the convention. I was going to bring the baby out um, and, and, and everything, but I got COVID that week and it was such a disappointment, but I'm just thankful for you having me on and the resources you you provide for everyone and, and young coaches. And if I could just give some advice to just, just be authentic, just be yourself. And, and if you strive to be a lifelong learner and surround yourself with good people, uh, special things can happen. So I, I appreciate you having me on again. By the way, get your daughter ready for the water park in Nashville. I'm ready. She'll, she'll be ready in a, in you know a year from now. She's gonna be ready for the water park. And nothing's gonna stop me from that. So I'll <laughs> see you there. All right, Maddie. Good luck with the start of the season. Okay, thanks, bud. Appreciate it.